Welcome to the 3ABN Cyber School panel. My name is John Dinsey and I'm glad that you have joined us and I hope you have already downloaded a copy of the quarterly, which is entitled Managing for the Master Till He Comes. This week's lesson is entitled The Tithing Contract. And we, I'm glad we have our panelists for today, Pastor John Lomakang to my left. To be here, I cover Monday, where's the storehouse? I'm really looking forward to that study. I am also, and we have Sister Jill Morricone. What day do you have? Thank you, Brother Johnny. I have Tuesday, the purpose of tithing. Amen. Sister Shelley Quinn, how about I, you? I have Wednesday, and this is a question that people ask all the time. Are we supposed to tithe on the gross or the net income? Very practical. Mm, interesting. We have Evangelist Ryan Day with us. Amen. I have Thursday's lesson entitled, An Honest and Faithful Tithe. Excellent. Well, as you can hear by the titles, this is going to be a very interesting lesson. So I hope you will join us, get your Bible ready, and dive in. But before we do that, we are going to go to the Lord in prayer, and we are asking Sister Shelley Quinn if you will do that for us. Absolutely. Holy and righteous Father, we pause once again to come before your throne of grace. We thank you for the gift of Jesus, the gift of your Holy Spirit, and the gift of your Word. Now as we open your Word, please make it clear. Send your Spirit to be the teacher. We give you all the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We depend on the Holy Spirit to help us during our study and during the presentation. The lesson has a memory text and it's taken from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not, Open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it or contain it, as it says in the King James Version. So we have uh, a couple of things that I'm going to cover here. One is uh, take, both are taken from the book of Genesis uh, concerning the experience of Abram when he met King Melchizedek. And also we're going to talk a little bit about Jacob. And this week's lesson is for the Sabbath uh, review of January 21, 2023. And let's go right into Sunday's portion. That the title is Tithe Equals a Tenth. Some people do not know that. But let's look at what the dictionary says. It says that a tithe is a tenth part of something or a 10%. And this definition, uh, as the lesson points out, is taken likely from the Bible narrative. This is where we find uh, this word. And tithe simply means returning 10%. Uh, as you have heard in other lessons, you're not paying the Lord 10%. You are returning the Lord 10% because what you have, you have received of the Lord. And God is the one that gives us health and strength to be able to work. God is the one that supplies our needs. And you are simply expressing your gratitude by returning a 10%. Now we're just covering the word tithe, but you also hear the word offering during this study. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 tells us, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. So here in this scripture, we have God telling us that the seed of the land, the fruit of the tree, uh, in these days, most people do not work with the land. Most people do not work with trees. People work different jobs, and today you're getting paid uh, normally in the currency, wherever you may be, whatever country you may be. And your salary, then you look, as you look at your salary, you're returning 10% of your salary. Uh, I'm reading from the lesson. It says, the tithing legislation given to Israel at Mount Sinai points out that the tithe is holy and belongs to God. It doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God. It is considered holy. It is for holy use. God asked for His 10%. Our offerings of gratitude are separate from and in addition to the tithe. The tithe is the minimum testimony of our Christian commitment. Nowhere in the Bible do we find any indication that God's portion is less than a tenth. Now, some people uh, believe that they are doing all that they are 
required to do when they return 10%. You know, and I, I don't know, I've never done it this way. I feel uncomfortable because people say 10% and they take out their calculator. Let's see, that's $100.32. And they, they do it just that way. You are, you are doing this to the letter. But why, why limit yourself to 32 cents? Why don't you just round off, not to the negative, up to the next dollar, I would suggest to you, so that you are keeping uh, the 10% plus you're giving a little more. But don't consider the 60 something cents that are left as your offering. Make that the tithe. The offering is uh, for the Thanksgiving for the things the Lord has done for you. Are you grateful to the Lord for what He's done for you this week? Are you grateful to the Lord for what He's done for you that particular day? Give the Lord an offering because this is an expression of your gratitude to the Lord. Uh, now, as we consider Psalm 107, verse 8 and 9, look at this uh, beautiful scripture. Now, when you look at Psalms 107, this, what I'm about to read, is repeated uh, four or five times. It says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. For He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Every single individual in the world mm -hmm. daily receives blessings from the Lord. Every single individual. So really, uh, the Lord is expecting, uh, expecting us to show our gratitude and to return to Him what He is claiming as it is His. Really, 100% belongs to Him, but He's just asking us to return 10%. What a marvelous God. He could have said, ah, give me 99% and you keep 1%. But no, the Lord is kind and considerate of us and He's only asking for 10%. And when He's asking for 10%, is that you are also preparing yourself to be blessed more than you can contain, as we read in the memory text. Let's go to Genesis chapter 14, and let's pick up on the story of Abraham. Abraham at this point, uh, it is beginning in verse 18. Uh, this is after uh, Abraham uh, gathered his servants together and rescued Lot. Uh, and his family. Notice what it says in verse 18 and onward. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him, that is Abram, and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Verse 20. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all. Notice how Melchizedek pointed out to Abraham that the Lord was the one that blessed and delivered the enemies yeah. into his hand. And so uh, it says that he gave him a tithe of all. Uh, we have Abraham here that appears, uh, very res he's very respected, he's considered the father of the faithful, but he's giving a tithe of all to Melchizedek. Yeah, here in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 and 9, verse 1 through 9, the story of Melchizedek is repeated. And it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. It says that Melchizedek was without father, without mother. That doesn't mean that he didn't have one. That means the Bible does not uh, present the information, doesn't show the information. It says without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. There's no record of how he died. And it says, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, notice this, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithe from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. 
Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. I don't know if you caught this verse carefully. Notice what it says in verse 8 once again. Here mortal men receive tithes. This is present tense. It doesn't say here mortal men receive tithes in the past. Here mortal men receive tithes. That was still in practice during the time of Paul. But there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. So tithe is still to be practiced by God's people to return the tithes through the storehouse. And you'll hear more of this as we go along in this lesson. So I'm reading to you now from the lesson. It says the first mention of tithe in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 14. That is the word tithe specifically, which tells the story of Melchizedek meeting with Abraham. Now in the bottom of that paragraph, it says, Now in the Hebrew story that neither that neither Melchizedek nor Christ were of the tribe of Levi. So tithing precedes and follows the specialness of the Levites. So it is before them. Tithe already is, existed. Tithing is not exclusively a Jewish custom and did not originate with the Hebrews at Sinai. It existed before. Now I would like to say this. Uh, I wrote it here so that I won't forget it. Uh, it says, if we say to ourselves that tithing and the giving of offerings is only for the Jews, then we must also conclude that the blessings and promises of the Lord of protection and other blessings that are described concerning the tithe, hmm. we must then say that the blessings that God describes of pouring out a blessing, that there will not be room enough to contain it, that's only for the Jews. They are the ones that are only going to be blessed in this way. But if we understand that tithing is for all, the Lord is willing to do for us the same thing. Pour out a blessing that there's not room enough to contain it. So I encourage you to uh, return to the Lord the tithe that belongs to Him. I barely have time to uh, read here about Genesis uh, chapter 28, verse 13 to 15. Let's hurry along and uh, talk about what happened here. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, this is the ladder that Jacob saw. And uh, it says, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land of which you lie. I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. If you continue reading, you will notice that Jacob made a vow to return to the Lord a ten. 10% of all that the Lord would bless him with. It, it exists before the people of Israel, and it is still for us today. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Johnny. Appreciate that. Now, Monday, where is the storehouse? This is a very relevant question today in light of we don't live in a world that is as monotheistic as it used to be. We have so many ministries, so many places where people consider they are blessed by the ministry that comes from uh, wherever the locations are to their hearts. But I want to begin with the very same passage, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, because this passage says certain things but doesn't say others. Let's look at it again. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. In my mind, I'm almost quoting the King James Version because I was raised on that. I could say it verbatim. We used to do that every Sabbath in our church after the tithe and offering came down and the deacons came down to the front and the elders and held it up in the whole church, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And so when I hear this, it takes me back to, to the realization that this is not something new, but notice what the passage didn't say. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, but initially it doesn't designate where that is. Mm -hmm. However, when this was written to the people that, I, that we talked about in a prior lesson, the Israelites knew exactly where God was indicating. You find in the central locations, uh, as you go through the lesson, let's read this here in the lesson. I'll read it to you. It says, um, God does include in his directions that there may be food in my house. His people understood that God's house 
initially was the sanctuary, mm -hmm. the elaborate tent that was built by specific directions given to Moses at Mount Sinai. Later, when Israel lived in the Promised Land, the central location was first in Shiloh, and then more permanently at the temple in Jerusalem. So what's the inference here? Wherever God's people were gathering, where the ministry continued, where the Levitical priesthood operated, where the people were being fed and the people were being ministered to, that was God's storehouse. But now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 12 and let's walk through this together because there's some specific verses here that are included and that there's a particular question that comes from reading these verses, but let's start with the verses. Deuteronomy 12, starting with verse 5. But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses, and I'll break them down into five components after this. Out of all your tribes, to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand. You and your households in which the Lord your God has blessed you. Notice what he says further here. You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. So let me pause right there. There are people today that say, well, I want to give my tithe here. I want to give my tithe there. Well, this is where I feel my tithe should go. But the Bible says into the storehouse. So the Bible is going to continue to develop the picture because as it was then, so it is today. Many people are choosing what they conclude the storehouse to be but the Bible is specific. Let's go on to verse nine. For as yet you have not come to the rest in the inheritance which the Lord your God has given you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in safety. Watch this, verse 11 then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you'll find out what the six points are after we finish reading this. There you shall bring all that is commanded you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice offerings, which you vow to the Lord. Verse 12, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites who is within your gates, since he has no portion nor inheritance with you. In verse 13, finally, take heed to yourselves that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, mm. but in the place where the Lord chooses. Mm -hmm. In one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings and there you shall do all that I command you. So you'll notice here in the very beginning, bringing all the tithes into the storehouse, there's no specificity. But as you read through verses 5 to 14, the Lord starts whittling down, making it very, very clear where he'd like the monies to be given. So let's bring the, the six takeaways, the five takeaways. The first thing I found here is allow the place where God chooses to be the place that you support. Now, I'm a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I always encourage our members because the Adventist Church works on a, a premise of, let me give you the infrastructure. You have the local church, then you have the local conference, then you have the union, then you have the division, then you have the general conference. But before the local church, you have the people. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the individual that blesses the local church. A portion of that, all of the tithe go to the local conference. A lot of people just make it very clear. Some people have thought through the years that Adventist pastors get paid a lot of money. And some people have said, well, how much comes into your church on a weekly basis? Zero of the tithe that comes into the local church stays at the local church. It goes to the local conference and their designations are made. Specifically, some of those designations is the tithe. A portion of that is used to pay the salaries of pastors and of teachers. And a portion of that then go to the union office a portion of that 
to the division office, which in the case of our church, the North American division, and a portion of that to the general conference. Many people don't understand how the Adventist church works. It is a grassroots, starts with the people going up. And now let's, that's the blessing. Mm -hmm. So the local person blesses the local church. Now let's look at the offerings. The offerings, as a matter of fact, I have a church board meeting. And so this is very fresh in my mind. We have what's called trust funds. The local church operates based on the offerings. We designate the different offices like deacons, deaconesses, elders. We have youth ministries. We have women's ministries, men's ministries. We have various functions of the church where we designate what that budget is going to be. So that's what the offerings are. But every Sabbath, a different offering is chosen by the conference that be, is able to furnish in various parts of the worldwide work. Let's just say there's a church being built in the Philippines. Well, 13th Sabbath offering, which is what the Sabbath school lesson often designates in the very back, what the 13th Sabbath offering is going to be. That means all the churches that day send that particular offering for that designated project so that that particular area of the world is blessed. But it starts with the people. It starts with us. So let's follow the curse now. Let's reverse it. If the local person doesn't give, the local church suffers. If the local church has nothing to pass on, the local conference suffers. And the local conference has nothing to pass on, the local union suffers. And then the division and the general conference. And what happens? The work in the world begins to dry up. Mm -hmm. The Adventist church is not built on a mega church platform. It's built on a grassroots platform. Mm -hmm. So we rather cover more territory with more churches than have a 300, you know, a 30,000 member church or 12,000 member church. Some of our universities have conferences, uh, have, have uh, schools and churches that are connected to them. Some of our colleges do. But generally, we speak of a, of a method system that was actually developed way back in the day. It's also used in the Methodist church. And, um, but it's designed to make sure that the storehouse in each of the local churches, each of the local conferences, the storehouse designates where those funds are going to go. And so here are the very, very quick six takeaways. One, allow the place where the Lord chooses to be the place that you support. Secondly, invest your time, talent, treasure in God's dwelling place. He decides that. Thirdly, the place of your benefits should be the place of your giving. That's where the local offerings come to the local church. Fourthly, do not give your funds randomly, as the Bible says, in every place that you see. Now, you can still support local ministries, but don't direct your tithe to local ministries. And lastly, number five, God's storehouse should be the place of treasured investments, bringing all the tithe into the storehouse. And there will be food. There will be supply in the local church. And the people will benefit from the local all the way to the general conference. And the work that God designates around the world will thrive. But it all begins with you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lomakang. Well, we are not done. We have more studies to share with you, and we'll be back in just a moment to continue. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study. We continue with lesson number three, the tithing contract. And now we are on Tuesday with Sister Jill Morricone. Thank you so much, Pastor John and Brother Johnny. Thank you. What an incredible study. I am Jill Morricone. On Tuesday, we have the purpose of tithing. You know, I remember growing up, I would say uh, one of the statements I hated that my mom and my dad said to me, four words. Can you guess what they are? Because I said so. <laughs> Were you ever told that? I would say, but why? But why do we have to do it this way? But because I said so. So why do we tithe? Because what God is so. its purpose? Why do we tithe? We could literally say, because God said so. And that literally should be a good enough reason. God's commands are not suggestions. God said it and I believe it and that settles it for me. 
yet are there more reasons that we need to tithe, that we need to return to God what is rightfully His? I'm going to give you six purposes of tithing. Why should we tithe? Purpose number one, we give because the tithe belongs to God. Mm -hmm. We're going to Leviticus 27. I think Brother Johnny read this earlier. Leviticus 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, mm -hmm. it is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. That means the tithe, the one-tenth, it belongs to God. It's holy. You know, humanity... We don't consecrate the tithe to God. We don't make it holy. It already is. Mm -hmm. Just like, I don't want to stretch this too far, but we don't make the Sabbath holy. Right. God's the one who set it apart. Right. God's the one who made it holy. With the tithe, we don't make it holy. We don't consecrate it. All we do is return to God what is rightfully His because it's holy to the Lord. Mm -hmm. It belongs to God. It would be stealing if we were to keep that back for ourselves. We give because the tithe belongs to God. Purpose number two, we give tithe for the support of the gospel ministry. This is what Pastor John just talked about. We're gonna look at the support of the gospel ministry from the Old Testament and from the New. The Old Testament, we're gonna to go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 18, We'll pick it up in verse 21, Numbers 18, verse 21. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they performed, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Now the children of Levi, the Levites, would be what we consider the ministerial force of the Old Testament. Would they not be? Mm -hmm. They would be the pastors. They would be the ministerial force of the children of Israel. I've given them the tithes all the tithes in the land of Israel. Now, it's interesting to me that the Levites received the tithe, did they not, from the land of Israel? Right. But the Levites tithed themselves, and where did their tithe go? It went to the priests. Mm -hmm. Their tithe went to the priests. Let's jump down to verse 24, Numbers 18, 24. For the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore I said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. So the Levites were not given an inheritance. Remember when they conquered the land of Canaan, they crossed the Jordan River, Jericho was the first to fall, and then the land of Canaan was conquered, and it was divided among the tribes. They each received land. They received an inheritance. This was for their children and their children's children. This was for agriculture and for them to grow crops and to produce fruit on the land. But the Levites were not given that inheritance. They were given the tithe as their sustenance for their work in the gospel ministry. We give tithe for the support of the gospel ministry. That was Old Testament times. Let's look at New Testament. We're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 13 and 14. Paul's talking here, and I know Brother Johnny had referenced that the tithe was in place long before the children of Israel. We saw that with Melchizedek. And we see that the tithe, the money was to be given for the support of the gospel ministry and the gospel ministers. We see this clearly here in 1 Corinthians 9, 13. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things were 9 verse 13? Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar, verse 14. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should what? Should live from the gospel. Mm -hmm. Gospel workers have the right to material support from those who benefit from that gospel ministry. Now, if you read the passage, Paul says, I myself did not exercise this right. But he's not saying that the right does not exist there. We give tithe for the support of the gospel ministry. Purpose number three. We give tithe or return tithe because it works out the selfishness of my own heart. Mm -hmm. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse seven. Second Corinthians nine, seven. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. Have you seen a grudging giver, Pastor John? <laughs> you know, I don't know, when the plate is passed, 
maybe we give and we don't make a face, but internally, are we grudging? Internally, are we saying, well, I really don't want to give it this week because I had in mind something that I wanted to purchase for myself. Let each one give as he purposes in his, in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. When we give to others, have you ever noticed that? It pulls you out of yourself. When you focus on others, it pulls you from thinking, stops you from thinking about yourself. When you give financially or monetarily to others, it brings out of us that selfishness, that pride, that vanity. We stop focusing on that and instead we focus on God. So we give tithe, we return tithe to God because it works out of our hearts, our own selfishness. Purpose number four, we give tithe because it develops our trust in God. Right. Have you experienced that in your life? Here's a quote from the lesson. Tithing is important because it helps us establish a relationship of trust with God. Have you ever noticed that the nine tenths goes farther than the 10 tenths right. ever did? Mm -hmm. I remember, one of my girlfriends, this was years ago, and she said to me, Jill, the tithe, it, you know, if we, if we look on paper, here's the income, she and her husband were married, if we look at the income that comes in and I calculate all of the bills that I have, there's no way that the bills can even be paid with the income that we have. And yet I want to be faithful to God. I want to trust God. I want to return to him what he has commanded, what he has said to return to him. And you know what happened? She said at the end of the month, I have no idea how it happens, but the bills are always paid. Yeah. Now, how does that equal? Hmm. The input does not equal the output. And yet for whatever reason, God pours out a blessing. We tithe because it teaches us to trust God. Purpose number four, we're going to pouring out a blessing. We tithe because of God's promised blessings. Malachi 3 verse 10. We've referenced this verse before, Malachi 3 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me or prove me now in this, says the Lord. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing, there will not be room enough to receive it. What are those blessings? Clearly, they are financial, but they're not always financial. Think of the children of Israel. God can extend the longevity of your shoes. Did he do that to the children of Israel? God can extend the longevity of your clothes. 40 years they wandered and their sandals did not wear out. God can keep your tires going even if they're old. God can bless your marriage and home. Do you not think that's a promise? A direct result of returning that tithe to God? It is financial, yes, but God can bless your marriage and home. God can expand and grow your ministry for Him. God can heal your relationships and give you opportunities to evangelize and to share Him with others. God can take your testimony, that's right, your testimony, and use it to encourage others to follow him. We tithe because God promises to pour out blessings upon those who tithe. And purpose number six, the last purpose, we tithe because it shows to whom we belong. This is my favorite one. Luke 16, 13. No man, no servant can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So do we belong to God or do we belong to money? Who is our idol? Who is our master? We tithe because it shows that we belong to God, that we don't serve self, that we don't serve Satan, that we serve God. We tithe because the tithe, it belongs to God, because it is for the support of the gospel ministry, because it works out our own selfishness and it teaches us to trust God, because God will pour out promised blessings upon you and because it shows the world to whom you belong. Hey, right. man, Amen. that was right. incredible. Nice. That was a great one. I'm Shelley Quinn and I have Wednesday's lesson. Boy, this is just simple and practical. It's tithing on the gross or the net income. If you are a salaried employee or an hourly, if you work by the hour, if you earn a salary from someone else, you tithe on your income. If you are a business owner, let's say that uh, 
you build cabinets, you tithe on your increase. What do I mean? If you sell a set of cabinets that you built for $10,000, but the cost of the goods, it cost you 9,000 to make them, your increase would be 1,000 and you would be paying your tithe on that increase. Now the question is, do we pay tithe on our income or increase before or after government taxation? I know this is a question that our uh, pastoral department gets a lot. I want to read to you from a quote from the Sabbath School Quarterly. It says, studies of membership's giving habits in the Seventh-day Adventist Church reveal that the majority of Seventh-day Adventists tithe on the gross income, that is, before taxes are taken out. The bottom line on gross or net, in other words, we're not talking about bottom line financially. He's mm -hmm. just saying, hey, to get down to the nuts and bolts of this, it is up to each person to decide. The church does not mandate what we should do, and rightly so. In the end, we each need to make our own choice whether we're going to tithe on our income before taxation or after taxation. And whatever we do, we must not judge those who do differently. Let me hit the pause button here. We've got to quit being so judgmental of God's children. You know, so often, if we don't do everything exactly like someone else, people get upset, and that's not our job. So he says, each one of us individually has to answer to God and God alone for our choices. And then there's a quote from Testimonies for the Church, volume four, page 469. Everyone is to be his own assessor and is left to give as he purposes in his heart. Now, I want to share a personal testimony that's similar to your friends. J.D. and I married. We had a, we were business partners before we married. We had a crooked partner. We were $250,000 in debt when we got married. Well, we ended up we ended, up, we ended up going into another business and we were making, had a good cash flow, bringing in lots of cash flow. But by the time you figured your job, you know, the, the job cost and all, the profit margin had to all go to paying back this debt that we came into our marriage with. We were living on $100 a month. And I'm telling you what, I was the coupon clipping queen. And, and God still blessed us. That hundred wasn't even, there wasn't anything to tithe on is what I'm saying. There was no increase. And so one day I was praying and the Lord impressed me that we should give a hundred a month. And I went to JD and I said, even though we don't have really an increase, God's impressed me we should give a hundred a month. And we started doing that. And you know what? Like your friend. I can't explain it to you. I kept the books for our, our company. I, I would think, how did God do this? We would end up, we were so much better off when we started giving a hundred. That was everything we had to live on. It's amazing. So let me tell you about God's amazing provisions. Let's turn to 1 Kings 17, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 16. This is a great story. So, God is here speaking uh, to Elijah, and this is during the famine. And he says, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow to provide for you. Now, this famine in the land was caused by drought. Zarephath was a Gentile Phoenician city in a territory that was controlled by Ahab's father-in-law, the father of wicked Queen Jezebel, and Baal was worshipped there. So it's funny because the Baal worshippers believed he was a fertility god and that he brought the rains and, and caused mm -hmm. the crops to grow. 
Well, they were learning that their, their idol uh, couldn't make their wheat and olive trees grow. So widows were usually very poor. And, it, you know, they were the first ones to run out of food in the famine. So it just does it, the directive for God to tell him to go, Elijah, go to this widow. It doesn't, it's kind of a strange directive. Verse 10. So he, Elijah, arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little cup of water that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So he's kind of like testing the, the widow. Uh, asking for a drink of water, and she responds favorably. Then he asks for bread, and listen what she says. Verse 12, this is 1 Kings 17, 12. So she, the widow, says, As the Lord your God lives. So she recognized him as a godly, as an Israelite and a, a man of God. I do not have bread only, a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Hmm. So her statement, as the Lord your God lives, verifies that she believes in Elijah's God, but she's affirming, I've only got enough wheat and oil for the last meal. This is like being on death row. And this Gentile woman, though, believed that God was alive. So verse 13, Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel. He's, he's giving her God's word now. The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. Elijah calmed her fears. He asked to be fed first. She gave, he gives her this promise on the authority of God's word. And you know what? Somehow this widow believed. Baal, this fertility God, couldn't increase the wheat or the oil during this time but she believed that God, the almighty God of heaven, could produce this miracle of flour and oil in the drought. So she, it, this is a severe test of her faith, I yeah. would think, because, you know, parents, every parental instinct, you want to take care of your kids. Verse 15, she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. She honored the Lord by her faith in his word. And if she hadn't responded in faith, what would have happened to her? She would have died. She and her son both would have died. God showed his power because she believed his word. He miraculously provided for her and he protected her. So what this story tells me, what your friend found out, what we found out, God is alive and he gives life and we can trust his word. Mm -hmm. Every miracle of God begins with a responsive first step of faith from us. Obedience is the pathway to God's blessing. So at his word, we return what he says is holy and belongs to him. And that's either a tenth of our increase or a tenth of our income. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. It was great, Shelley. Thank you, Jill and Pastor Loma King and Pastor Denzi. A great summation of what it means to tithe, the significance of tithing. And I'm sure we're going to talk a whole lot more about this as we continue through. My name is Ryan Day and I have Thursday's lesson and it's entitled An Honest and Faithful 
tithe. You know, truthfully, we could hear all of this incredible knowledge that we've just learned and it, all of it is equally important. But if you had all of that information just tucked away in your mind, but yet you didn't practice this last portion, which is what Thursday's highlighting, and that is continuing to return an honest and faithful tithe, well, then you've fallen short. And so uh, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 and 2, just to kind of set the tone for this lesson. And again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And then verse 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. It's a requirement. It's not a suggestion. It's not, I wish you could, I wish you would. God is saying it's a must. It's a requirement. If I'm going to trust you with my property, my resources, which we've learned in previous lessons, it's all God's. God owns it all. Uh, then we must be faithful to that. So just doing a real quick review of what we've looked at so far in each one of the day's lessons leading up to Thursday, we've learned the amount in which we should tithe, right? Uh, which is a tenth or 10% of our income or increase. Uh, and of course, we also looked at where we take our tithe or where we, where we are to return the tithe. And that is to the storehouse. And of course, this is the place in which the gospel ministers are paid. And then, of course, we just looked at honoring God with the first part of our income. In other words, putting God first and returning that on the top. Uh, but then this last part, you'll notice those three that I just mentioned leading up uh, to today's. Uh, all of that is, is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to, to return the appropriate amount. It's our our responsibility to make sure it gets returned to the storehouse appropriately uh, so that it can be distributed appropriately to the ministers. And of course, it's our responsibility to make sure that it's taken uh, from the proper amount of income that we make or that we have of, of our increase. But then it lists a fourth reason, and that brings us to Thursday. And this is not necessarily our responsibility because now we've returned it, right? We've done our part, but now it's the, it's, uh, it's the responsibility, of course, of those receiving, in this case, the storehouse, the ministers, the leadership who are overseeing this. And the lesson brings out that uh, number four, used for the right purpose to support the ministry. And so we return, it goes on. Now it's, now it's the leadership of the storehouse. It's their responsibility to make sure that that tithe goes on and is used appropriately. Now I only highlight this because <laughs> I've had, I've had many people over the years tried to, uh, you run into those people and, and you would think that they're a small minority and perhaps maybe they are, but still in abundance in numbers. You have those individuals that say, well, I don't, I choose to return my tithe however which way I feel is best because I don't trust such and such conference or such and such this, or I'm not going to return my tithe to the conference because, well, I don't trust them. I don't think that they're using their monies properly, or I don't think that they're doing this or that. Uh, and, and it's interesting because I tell a story and it's always stuck with me even to these years. Uh, early on in my ministry, I was conducting an evangelistic series. And I'll never forget this. One night I had a particular family invited me out. It was myself, the pastor in this particular family. And we're sitting down to eat. And uh, of course, this particular family love them to death, but they had a particular agenda. They, they wanted to discuss with me some things and they wanted to get my input as to, you know, new evangelists coming to town. And so we're sitting at the dinner table and they start to express very clearly their irritations and about, you know, how they don't really return tithe to, you know, the conference or to the storehouse as, as, as expected because they don't trust this and they don't think it's being used right, right this way. And they start expressing all of this and then they put me on the spot. Again, this is early in my ministry. I'm still learning. I'm still growing, but they put me on the spot and they're like, so what do you think, Pastor Day? Do you think, uh, shouldn't we, you know, take our tithe and give it and support and give it to those, you know, wherever we think it should go based on what we feel is best for the Lord. And, and as I'm, as I'm pondering in my mind and I'm trying to determine how am I going to respond to this, the pastor who was with me, God bless him, love the man to this day. He, he spoke up and he read, he, he mentioned this story. I want to, I want to mention this story to you. In fact, I want to read it from the Bible. This is found in Luke 21 verses one to four. I'm going to read the story and then I'm going to give you the pastor's response, which has stuck with me all these years. And it's just, it's just been a great testament and how to respond to these individuals that say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to decide for myself where I think this should go and how much I should give to whoever. Luke chapter 21 verses one through four. This should be a familiar story to many people. 
It says, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. This is speaking of Jesus. Jesus looks out. He sees because they're near the temple. They're near the sanctuary. He sees the crowds of people dropping their monies into the treasury box. And then verse two, it says, and he saw also a certain poor widow put in two mites. And he said, truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than you all or more than all for all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. He referenced this story and then he says to them, and it was just real humble the way he said it. He said, you know, Jesus is the master of the universe. He knows all. And you know good and well, he knew the hearts of those men that were over the treasuries. He knew the hearts of those Pharisees who were wicked. These are the same Pharisees that for three chapters in the book of Matthew, he's going to rebuke you hypocrites left and right. So Jesus knew that these were wicked men in their hearts and that they were not uh, living up to the fulfillment of the leadership that they were called to be. Honestly, Jesus easily could have said to the crowd or especially to this honest widow woman, oh, no, 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 please, no, don't put your monies there. Please don't return that to them. These are all hypocrites. They're going to misuse and abuse the monies. Don't provide it there. Go give it over here to someone else or to this other place. And he brought that story up and it was just something simple but very profound that, you know, we are, we're responsible to return that faithful type. And once we do that, it's the responsibility of the leadership between them and the Lord, how it is that they are to distribute that accordingly. It's up to us to return it faithfully and to be responsible and to be trustworthy, uh, trusting and that God is going to see it go to where it needs to be. And, you know, this is also illustrated furthermore uh, of, of the significance of returning an honest and faithful tithe when we get to one of the most significant parables that Jesus would ever tell in his ministry. Of course, that's a rather lengthy parable, but we find it in Matthew 25 verses 14 through 30. We may not have time to read it all, but I just want to highlight a few points here. Of course, this is the parable of the talents. And what Jesus is, de is, is describing here is that, you know, each one of us receive according as he wills, but we're all expected to return and to use those talents and to use those resources and be stewards accordingly and to be faithful in our returning of it. Um, then we're going to start in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 25. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one, he gave five talents to another another two and to another one to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. I just like to highlight here, Jesus does that with us. You know, we often wonder, why does it seem like that person over there has more than me? And why does that person over there not have as much? You know, God knows the heart and he knows according to our own ability. He knows if that person is going to be a, a, a someone he can trust uh, and trust with that, with those funds or with that wealth or whatever it is, those talents or whatever it is he's given us. For some, he gives a little, for some, he gives much, but it doesn't matter with still still up to us to make sure that we faithfully return it and use it according to our ability. Verse 16, it says, then those who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. Verse 18, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. Then he noticed his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He also had, who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents beside them. And the Lord said also to him, well done. Thank you. Enter. And of course, we get down here to 24. Notice what it says. Verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But of course, you keep reading down in this parable. It says, but the Lord uh, answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. You ought to have deposited my 
money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the ones who or to the one who has ten talents. In this case, we're learning the lesson that you know what, it doesn't matter what talents we all have talents, we all have gifts, some more than others, but it's our responsibility to use those resources, whether it be money, in this case, whether it be a talent. You know, I sing, Pastor Loma King sings, Pastor Loma King preaches, we all preach, we all teach, but we all have different abilities and different ways in which we use the gifts that God has given us. It's not about who's better than the other or who has more or less than the other. It's all about, are you faithful with what the Lord has given you? Be honest and be faithful to the Lord will bless you abundantly. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, we now take a moment to ask each and every one of you to give a final comment. You know, the Lord gave this to me. He says, we don't give out of the ability or the capacity of our wallets. We give out of the gratitude of our hearts. Mm -hmm. That's why the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. We okay. don't give out of the capacity of our wallets, but out of the gratitude of our hearts. Amen. Acts 20, 35. I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus. He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Experience the blessings of God when you open up your heart and you begin to give to others and to support his work. God declared a portion of time as holy. It's, it's the seventh day of each week. He declared a portion of our income, 10% as holy. I wonder why? Because God loves you. He wants to bless you. And the more you learn to trust in the Lord with your time, your talent, your money, the more He can bless you. Trust God. Amen. Thank you. The end of Matthew 25, verse 29, it says, For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. My friends, God has given to us all. What will you do with it? Will you allow God to use what he's blessed you with in terms of resources, monies, talents, gift, time, whatever it is that he's provided? How will you use it? Will you be faithful? Will you be honest? That's what God's, God is calling us to be. He's called us to be an honest and faithful returner of that which is His. Amen. Thank you very much. I bring to you once again the memory text, which is Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me. And in this, uh, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Malachi 3.10. I encourage you to return to the Lord a faithful tithe. And I'd like to leave you with this uh, in Psalm 116.12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I encourage you to also give offering to the Lord. Next week's lesson is entitled Offerings for Jesus. Join us then for another interesting and powerful Bible study.